Hi, I'm Ron Spurenberg, co-founder and CEO of Hi Mama. Welcome to our podcast about all things early childhood education. In this week's episode, we discuss how early childhood educators must take an active role in turning theory to action on positive change for the profession. We speak with Shaniqua Cameron, a master's degree student at Ryerson University in Ontario and an active member of the board of the Association of Early Childhood Educators Ontario about the stakeholders that must work together in order to close the widening early childhood professionalization gap where expectations of early childhood educators are increasing while wages and working conditions are stagnant. To learn more about how you can take a more active role as a leader and spokesperson for early childhood educators in your community or even at the state or provincial level, stay tuned for this week's episode of the Preschool Podcast. (laughs) Shaniqua, welcome to the Preschool Podcast. It's so great to have you as a guest. Uh, Just to start out, I'd love to learn about how you got passionate about early childhood education and how you started down this road. Well, thank you, Ron. I have to say thank you for having me. And I also would like to say um, happy child care worker and early childhood educator appreciation day to the workforce today. Um, and so I think the most pivotal moment for me was when I was about to complete my Bachelor of Child Development at Seneca College around 2012. And I had a mentor, Dr. Diane Cashin, who was a professor at Seneca at the time. And she really encouraged me to reach out to the sector and to a large group of people who were doing advocacy to, you know, really create change in the sector and speak to the needs that ECs were being faced with. And the specific needs that I'm talking about are, you know, poor wages and um, an absence of benefits for for a large portion of the workforce. Once you had spoken to Diane about these issues. What did that prompt you to do from that point? Well, I knew that there were associations and that there were were active federations that were, you know, had been working endlessly and timelessly for especially specifically the Association of Early Childhood Educators of Ontario, who've been working for over 65 years, advocating for the needs of early childhood educators and childcare workers. And so I was aware, but I didn't know how to connect as a new practitioner and as someone who had less experience. And so Diane was pivotal because she did teach me in my diploma, but I, I did not know in between that time frame. So in about a three-year time frame, it was very hard to navigate as a new practitioner and finding out how could I be more active and more proactive. And so Diane encouraged me to be involved with the, our professional association. And so I reached out and then uh, my first step was um, becoming a board member on the association. Got it. From what you've observed in your work with Diane Cashin as a mentor, do you feel like there's a lot of mentorship happening in early childhood education? Did you see other colleagues who had mentors? Because I actually don't hear that too often, I have to say. I think that it depends because you really have to make a connection. So the connection has to be there. And I really respected Diane. I respected um, the things that she shared with us in, in class. She was very real. She was very honest. And she shared with us a reality that, you know, if you are planning to be dedicated to the sector and to be a professional in the sector, you need to know about what's going on. That's part of a professional, you know, obligation to be aware, to be aware of policy. And so I took that as an an additional duty on myself, not only to learn what was happening in the classroom and the course content, but to also do my research, what's happening with policy, what's happening in government, what are key stakeholders saying, and how is this shaping what the workforce, when I enter it, is going to be like. And so I faced that reality, and it was wonderful for Diane to kind of say to me, you know, you have opportunities to also work towards change for ECUs. Mm, Cool. And so how have you taken some of what Diane Cashin has taught you about uh, having an impact um, and applied it in some of the work you've done since then? Well, I say most recently um, in my research. And so with uh, towards the ending of my diploma and when I was finishing my diploma in early childhood at Seneca, I had to register and become a a registered member of the College of ECEs. And so that was something new, something new that was happening in Canada and new to the province. And so in my research that I completed in my master's that I recently finished at Ryerson this fall, I looked at the College of ECEs and I did a discourse analysis on a sample of their communication. So I really wanted to look at what are they saying to ECEs and how are they 
constructing a particular professional identity and way of being. And so what did your research find? What were they saying? So my research overall, from my research, mind you, I had a, a, a short time frame. And so I worked on this research through from the spring until uh, towards the ending of the summer. And so what I found were five key messages. And so I highlight a couple of them. Sure. Um, they were all positive. And so the college is saying that ECEs, and these messages were reoccurring, and I found them in um, professional. I'm just going to highlight where I found these messages. I think that's important to state. Um, so I looked at their fair practice reports. I looked at a sample of their annual reports and professional communications, which included uh, practice matters articles, as well as conversations with an ECE and professional magazines. And so um, one key message is that ECEs should, are accountable for their actions. And so this is not something that's um, specific to ECEs as a profession. This is something that you would see a lot of other regulatory bodies, such as for medical professions, saying the same thing. And that ECEs should engage in professional learning and that we are diverse people. We're diverse in culture. We're diverse in language. And so I saw all of these things as being positive messages. But what I didn't see and what I'm hoping to look at now more recently in the research that I'm going to be approaching in my new program is what is the identity of these ECEs um, that they're saying are accountable to these things, and who are they highlighting as these amazing ECEs? And what do you mean by identity? So identity, I mean professional identity, professional image. So there's particular image. I think that the college is very purposeful in who they highlight and in what they choose to highlight. And so, and when I say what, I mean the content that they choose to highlight. So if there's a particular thing happening in the sector, then that might be highlighted in a professional communication. So when changes happen in the sector, such as ECEs now being mandated to engage in professional learning, you'll see in their com communications, they'll have a lot of information about why ECEs should engage in professional learning and why they're required to do so. And so I didn't see these things as being negative or positive, but when I say in, uh, identity and image, I want to know, I want to look more deeply and probably at a larger sample of communication. And I want to pretty much probably do a content analysis and look at who, who is this person that they're, projecting is this ideal easy interesting and do you have any theories on your side about you know what you hope they would project or is or are you really just taking an objective view to say this is what they are currently projecting at this point i'm going to take an objective view but what i can say is that i see a lot of uh, a lot more advocacy happening for um, the male presence or professionals who do identify as male and who are in the sector and so i would say probably that there, this has happened because there's been less focus on the voice of male ECEs in the sector. And I do think that there's a lot of value in, in having their voice available and that their voices are being a, a highly advocated for and contributing member of all of these stakeholder groups that are happening. So most of the time you'll see that it's predominantly female. And so that's probably why there's more advocacy around the male voice being included because it hasn't been included as much. It's kind of an interesting point because in a lot of other industries or sectors, it's the opposite, right? Um, they right. they're traditionally have been male dominated. And so we're looking to have more diversity in terms of having more females um, participating in management and executive roles in companies. But for ECEs, it's kind of the opposite. And at the end of the day, my view is that diversity is always going to be beneficial. And so you are planning to pursue that further. Um, that research? I am planning to pursue that research further. And so currently I'm in the stages of doing a literature review and to look at what, what are people saying about, you know, how regulatory bodies construct their professional communications. So how do they market them and what decision making goes into putting together these documents? Awesome. Awesome. And as part of your role on the board of directors at AECEO in Ontario. How do you see organizations like the AECEO playing a role in early childhood education? Like, what, what, where do they stand, and what, what value do they add to the sector? Well, I would say that the AECEO has adds huge value to the sector because we're the only professional regulatory body for RECs working in Ontario, and so that's not unique to the, to. Um, across provinces or other territories or other province and provinces and territories that are working to advocate for early childhood educators and child care workers across Canada. But what I think is crucial in Ontario is that we have advocacy on both sides. 
And so what you're seeing is more transparency. So we have a regulatory body that essentially speaks to the needs of the public and stands up for the rights of children and protects the rights of children. And then we have the ACO, which speaks to the professional needs and of the, of the workforce, which are childcare workers and ECE. And so currently, um, the ECO has, ACO has recently um, updated its mission and purpose. And the mission is to build and support a strong collective voice for early childhood educators so that we can participate and influence positive change that benefits ECE. And so this positive change includes, you know, having fair wages, decent work, uh, comprehensive workforce strategy, and access to benefits, not just for a small few, but for the majority and all of the sector. Got it. And you said on the other side, there's a body that's representing the needs of the public and the children. And just for our audience, who would that be? And that is the College of ECEs, so, and sometimes called the CECE. Got it. Relative to your understanding of other jurisdictions, like would you say that Ontario is relatively progressive with these uh, regulatory bodies? No, I would say that we're highly progressive, considering that there are maybe three regulatory bodies in the world. So this is very unique to have this profession that that is regulatory regulated in this way. Okay, interesting. Okay, now you are also passionate about advocacy yourself, and uh, one of the things that you're uh, passionate about uh, related to the mission of AECEO is raising the professional profile of early childhood educators. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you're passionate about that and why you think that's important? I think that the professional profile of ECEs is important because it allows us to have trust, allows the community and the public to, to trust who we, are, who we say we are. So as RECs who are regulated, we are mandated to be trained, we're mandated to engage in ongoing learning. And so having a strong professional identity in the community with the, the people that we work with, with the families that we work with, means that we feel value. So in, in, in a way, we, we get value from you know, the pay, but I think on a greater level, on a big, bigger level, a lot of people get into the work and the care work because the contribution that it gives to their life is so monumental. So it's so rewarding. And what role do you think ECs themselves play in raising the professional profile of early childhood educators? I think we play a, a huge role in, in all decisions that, that we make. So in, in a sense, we, we kind of don't turn off. So when we're out in our own lives, we're still professionally accountable. So we're held to a certain degree when, when we're not working. You know, we're, we're accountable to be a representative of the profession at all times. So I would say that we, we do this and we demonstrate this in all of our actions by, you know, reaching out and collaborating with our colleagues, by spending time with our colleagues outside of work. And I would say a lot of my peers and I, we spend much of our time talking about work when we're outside of work because we enjoy it so much. Um, and so there's so many things that ECs are doing on a daily basis, working with each other, collaborating with other professionals that continues to raise the professional profile. But I would like to see more trust put in us and, and more people recognize the value and the worth of us. And then I think that more education needs to be done about the actual training that ECs go through because it's very, very rigorous and it covers a wide range of, of topics. And of course that's specific to the institution, but ECs are well equipped to meet the needs of children. And so I wish people knew more about the details of that. Totally. Now, let's say an organization like AECEO that um, represents early childhood educators, do they provide educators with any of these actionable things that they can go out and do to raise the profile of early childhood educators? They do. So I would direct people who may not know, be as familiar with information or who are looking to reach out um, to the ACO or gain more information about what exactly um, we do as an association to go to the website, which is www.aeceo.ca. Um, and so there's many things that you can do to be active and involved. And so number one, as a student, we have a student portal. And the student portal has tons of links to resources and 
students can engage together and uh, from different institutions using the portal. Um, also, from the main page, we have um, a link that, of course, directs you to, towards membership. So the best way to be active is to be a member, of course, but we also have resources that are accessible if you're not a member when you do click on the website. And so um, one key thing is that we consistently have different campaigns. And so um, the most recent campaign that we have is the Fair Wages campaign. And so that is connected to the recent report that the ACO released this month. And the report is entitled, I'm more than just an ECE, decent work from the perspective of Ontario's early childhood workforce. And so that was um, a collaboration between the ACO, the Ontario Coalition for Better Childcare, and the Atkinson Center at um, OIC, which is at the University of Toronto. And so together, um, these three associations collaborated to create three, eight, uh, sorry, eight community mobilization forums, um, which took place across the province. And within these forums, the ACO gathered tons of feedback along with the coalition and different representatives that went to the different mini series. And I think I wanna highlight something from the report because it's so pivotal and I think it speaks to why I became an advocate and why I wanted to you know, be a, a champion for my peers and be that voice that sometimes is shy in the early childhood educator workforce and bears the brunt of so many challenges. And so in the report, I'm just going to highlight it very quickly. It says, participants reported inconsistent working conditions across the sector with many educators and staff reporting that basic human necessities are regularly unmet. For example, participants noted that washroom breaks are sometimes impossible for staff because of ratio requirements. Furthermore, paid lunch breaks and dedicated staff rooms were reported to be inconsistent across settings and breaks are often missed or, or used as planning time. And so this is something that I face. This is something that many ECEs face across Ontario on a regular basis. And so what this demonstrates and highlights is that, you know, we're amazing professionals who are trained very well, but we're dealing with some very unfair working conditions that need to be addressed. And I would say immediately. So this all makes complete sense to me, uh, what AECO is doing and the point of this report. How do you think or hope that this report will result in actionable change? Well, we've gathered, gathered the feedback. As a professional association, we've gathered the feedback right from the key players. And those are the main principal stakeholders. And those are the people working what some people would call the front lines daily, reg reg registered early childhood educators. And so we gathered the feedback, and this has been going on for years. We have the regulatory body that says there's over 50,000 people registered now who are professionals. They're accountable. We can vouch for them, and we can say they're trained and that they're well-equipped to work with vulnerable ch children every day. And we need to move beyond words to action. And so what the ACO is continuing to do, along with other associations like the Canadian Child Care Federation, the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, they're all calling on the government and being a very loud and vocal predominant voice and saying and speaking to the needs of parents, families and children and the workforce. So you really want to get this report in front of those people in the government that can implement the change. Is that fair to say? That's right. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. And and you think that this report in particular will be quite impactful because the content in the report comes directly from people, quote unquote, on the front lines through this community mobilization form that people have completed. Yeah, and it's all it's also important to state that this is very timely, this report or this executive summary, because it speaks to the government's recent position. So the Ontario government's promise of having 100,000 new childcare spaces in Ontario is an amazing commitment. But, you know, from the position of the, the workforce, there's an estimated about 20,000 early childhood educators that are going to need to be working in these childcare spaces. And so what we're saying is we know that this is going to increase the amount of jobs that are available to the workforce, and that's amazing to have more opportunities. However, we need to address why we have high staff turnover in a sector, and that's mainly because of low pay. So low pay is something that uh, has coming up a lot here, uh, including in, directly in the mission of AECEO. That's obviously a key part of increasing the profile of early childhood educators and recognizing the complexity uh, of their work. First of all, why do you think the wages are lower than what, in, in my mind as well, they should be? And 
second to that, have you seen any progress there or do you foresee there being positive change in that respect going forward? Um, okay, so that's kind of a three-part question. And so I'll address the why. And I think um, that might speak to the historical timeline of the profession. And so we didn't always start out as a recognized profession that was regulated. And so starting out on that journey, we had to get to a certain place where we could call ourselves a profession before we could ask for professional wages. And I think that the ACO was a key, key stakeholder in, in you know, voicing that, that concern that, hey, we need to be recognized first. When we're recognized first, then we'll be able to demand for what we're, we're, we're truly worthy of. Um, as far as the current status, I would say that there has always been a par- portion of the sector that has allowed for higher salary and higher, higher hour, hourly wages, and, but that hasn't been open to a majority. It's always been a smaller portion of the sector, and so more recently, that would speak to ECs now being able to work in public schools and full-day kindergarten, and so they have access to a far better salary. But um, if you if you look at the needs of someone who might be working in, on a supply basis, for example, that salary is not really an adequate salary to support you know a healthy lifestyle. And so what we're looking for is more stability in the positions that are also available. Um, and as far as changes, I would like to see more comprehensive plan being produced. And so I know that many stakeholders have always discussed having, you know, a, a, a wage scale. And so there's a wage scale for Ontario that really needs to highlight, you know, where should we start at? And so within the executive story, summary that I also just referred to, um, a lot of ECs, and so this is a snapshot of, you know, a sample of ECs, and their position is that we should generally be around the $20 an hour range if, it, if you're going by an hour, hourly range. And so I think that there needs to be more feedback on what, a decent wage actually means for the profession and what, you know, access to benefits means. Because there's just too many, far too many people in the profession who are working right now um, um, in before and after school positions, for example, and they may or may not have access to benefits. They may or may not have be making enough money to be contributing to their pension. And so, you know, on, a, on the larger scale, we also need to be thinking about the profession and the care of the, these professional workers 30 years from now, 20 years from now. And so it sounds like what you're saying is that there is also a need to have more detailed documentation on what fair wages means and what is adequate benefits um, with a lot more detail about what that is and how we can actually implement the change to get there. That's right. Okay. A key example would be taken from other professions, such as the teaching profession, where there's much more job security much more uh, strength in their, in their numbers and their representation from both their professional side as well as their regulatory side. Interesting. One of the things that I also just wanted to uh, touch on quickly was something you mentioned earlier, which is that ECs oftentimes don't feel like they have a strong voice or don't project that strong voice. What would you say to your colleagues out there to help them get the confidence to go out and say, hey, you know, we deserve uh, fair wages and we are uh, a profession with a high aptitude in what we do. We're knowledgeable, we're educated, and we should be recognized for that. I think um, a lot of the time people respect people who use a lot of academic jargon, who can quote stats and who, you know, a lot of facts and can say, this is the reality because I can prove it and this is what research says. But I learned something um, very monumental from a colleague of a dear colleague of mine, and her name is Emily Wright. And I also recently met someone who shared their story for me, who demonstrated the power of narratives and sharing your own story. And so what I would say to my colleagues and to the workforce across the province is there's power in your story. And sometimes you it doesn't you don't need to include research and, and data to articulate, you know, what the reality is. Sometimes you just need to go with what the truth is and use your own meaning making, your own experience and share that because there's so much power in it. And recently I was moved by a story and, you know, the story, the context of the story was related to food for play and whether or not it's an appropriate thing to do. And the EC that shared her story started off her story by stating, you know, her experience and an experience of someone, a child she knew who, 
ate food in the garbage and had to navigate from the garbage. And so I think as ECEs, we, we shouldn't be shy to share our reality, to share the fact that we are dedicated to this profession, but sometimes we can't afford to put our children in this profession. That was a reality that I faced. And I think that there's power in sharing your own realities and we should all start with that. And if we can start with that, we can move the sector forward together. That's a really great message. Thanks for sharing that. The idea of the power behind real stories is definitely real. So that's uh, that's great advice. Just wrapping things up, you mentioned the website of AECEO. We are pretty passionate about also making sure that knowledge is available to early childhood educators out there. Do you have any other suggestions about places where people can go to get information about what's happening in early childhood education? Absolutely. So um, on the ACO website, first of all, there'll be connections and links to numerous other web, um, websites, organizations, and federations. Cool. Um, I also want to just highlight um, the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, which is at www.childcareontario.org. The College of EC will also have um, on numerous other links, and so I think from the professional side, uh, it's important for ECs to commit to navigating their website. And I, so I kind of advocate for that because I, I spent countless hours looking through their content um, <laughs> to count, well throughout the night, throughout the summer. And so I would encourage my, my colleagues and my peers to navigate their website and look at, you know, what are they really saying and, and which uh, connections and which resources are available on their website. Cool. Okay. Awesome. And um, what's exciting you most about what's happening in early childhood education right now? The passion that I see. I feel like the passion is, is is mounting amongst the sector, and and I feel, and I don't mean individual passion. I mean with the the climate within the sector. Um, and so this was probably sparked more recently at a conference that we had a few years ago in Winnipeg. That was the Child Care 2020 conference, where people across Canada mobilized. On a, it was a national conference, and so um, it was very unique. Montclair was there, um, and we had many. Um, Many stakeholders who, you know, drove the message home, we need change. And, and so I felt, I felt so powerful coming away from that. And I felt like it was a refueling process. And so every so often, there's these conferences and things that take place. And I would encourage a lot of people to reach out and go. There's tons of things that you can access for free through Eventbrite, for example. Um, and it, it really refuels you. And, you know, the more we, we get together, we'll, we refuse each other, and then we can work proactively toward, towards change because we're not going back to our, our lives and forgetting about our, our reality. It becomes a, a collective reality. Yeah, and I think you need that refueling every now and again, right? Because sometimes you can get stuck in, you know, the day-to-day, -day and you, you forget that there's this whole community of early childhood educators that are going through, you know, the same challenges as you are. And so to come together as a whole to have those conversations, I think, is super powerful. Shaniqua, you speak very passionately and very wisely about uh, early childhood education in Canada. It was really great speaking with you. I think you are a great example of leadership in early childhood education that the sector can really benefit from. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you very much, Ron. Thanks for having me. What's your name? Michaela. Michaela, how are you? Hi. You having fun playing? Yeah. It's a nice day, isn't it? Yes. What's your favorite thing to play out here? Playing the monsters. You like to play monsters? Do you like to swing? Okay. What else do you like to do? Play my Dora bike. Oh, with your Dora bike? Oh, okay. Do you ride fast? Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, have fun here. All right.